to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. It's Power Talk Friday. And before I tell you about today's guest, let me tell you about the real live Power Talk Friday tour that's coming to Las Vegas. So if you haven't heard yet, I am redoing my Power Talk Friday tour Las Vegas this year. It's going to be July 27th, Saturday, July 27th, 2019. If you've not heard of it, if you're new to the show, this is a live one day coaching event. It's limited to up to 15 interior designers. So very small. And honestly, we might be there with five, right? Who knows? I mean, I'm recording this way ahead, so I have no idea how many is going to be there. Um, but the point is, is that I'm, I'm not disappointed if it's five. I'm not disappointed if, if it's 15 because the people who are there are going to have the most amazing opportunity to change your business. So if you want some of that in your life, go to powertalkfriday.com, okay? This is live coaching with five business experts. You have my husband, Vin, you have myself, you have Eileen Hahn, you have Nancy Gansakalfer, and you have Stacey McKenna. Each one of us has a specific superpower. And each one of us together is, it's just like, it's like business coaching on steroids, right? So think about wherever you are in your business, whether you are brand new and you feel overwhelmed and not sure of what is the first and the second and the third step that you should be doing, this event is so small that you will get that information. It's set up specifically so that we have tons of time to work with you individually. By the same time, we had a designer that joined us last year that was more than 25 years in business and hitting almost a $2 million mark in sales. And her business was positively affected by it. Because you sit there and you're talking with people who have a breadth of knowledge and we overlap, intersect, and have our own lanes. And I really, really can't stress enough that no matter what you're going through, the, the, the thing is designed small enough specifically so that no matter what you're going through, we can help you. So maybe you're in business 10 or 15 or 20 years and you know that it's okay, right? You know that, you know, the money comes in and you pay your bills and you do a good job at your projects, but there's little thing in the back of your mind that is saying to yourself, am I really profitable? Am I really not only profitable, but am I maximizing my profits? And I know how to do everything that I know how to do, but I don't know how to figure that out. Well, we can help you figure that out, okay? How about if you are like me and you are never at a loss for another crazy idea to get your business going? That's how I am. I spend my whole day going, wow, we could do this and we could do that and we could do this. But thankfully, I have people around me that say, okay, Lou, can we like just like put 10 ideas on the table for just this morning and let's evaluate which ones can you do now, which ones can you do in two months, which ones could you do in a year, and which ones are going to be the ones that are going to make the difference for the financial health of the podcast. Okay. So, you know, we all need different things in our lives. Okay. And I love, love, and I'm talking from experience. I love, love that this event is small enough that no matter what your challenge is, whether it is needing clarity, it is needing focus, it is needing a plan to figure out what it is you sell and how do you sell it, okay? This is a small enough environment that you leave with that information. 
Promise, promise, promise. Okay? So, powertalkfriday.com. It's only $17.95 for the entire day. Um, five coaches at all charge between four and seven hundred dollars, four and eight hundred dollars an hour for their time. It's a bargain. And then of course we have the celebration dinner that night with all of us where we just sit and relax and we reflect and we are going to be with our sponsors, My Doma Studio and Revel Woods, where you'll get to meet the individuals that represent these companies. And um, just, you know, all of us will be there. And it's an awesome, awesome experience. Having gone through it two times already, I have to tell you, it it, it delivers. Okay. So powertalkfriday.com. All right. Now today on the show, I have Sarah Winchester with me. Sarah is a Boston based photographer who shoots all over the country, specializing in interiors and fine art photography. Raised in Atlanta, she brings her Southern sensibility and style to her work. After years in the corporate world as a creative director, brand manager, and in-house photographer, Sarah opened her own studio in 2009. Her strengths lie in blending the needs of the client with her own unique and artistic approach to create beautiful and effective images. Sarah's worked with clients which span the creative and professional world from magazines and fashion houses to advertising campaigns and construction companies. She also creates a series of fine art photography stemming from a passion of art and travel, creating beautiful images to to live with and to love. Now, on the show today, Sarah and I talk about not only how you, the designer, can find and hire the right photographer, but also for my interior photographers out there listening to the show, we talked a little bit about how you can set yourself apart and attract interior designers. That's a switch, right? <laughs> now, because off air, Sarah told me that she happens to know that I have a little base of interior photographers who are devoted listeners too, applying the same business lessons that you do to your design firm to their photography practices. So officially, welcome to my photographer friends. Now, we also talk about social media, content, styling, and getting published. But the interesting part came when we started talking about copyrights, usage, and all of the tricky nuances in between. So I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Before we get to it, a reminder that you want to give a big shout out and a thank you with me to our sponsor, article.com. You know by now, I've been talking to you about Article for over a year. If you are still without your trade account at article.com, please go to welldesigned.article.com. Well designed.article.com and you can sign up for your trade account. Article.com is an online only store for mid-century uh, Scandinavian inspired furniture. They have furniture for living rooms, for dining rooms, for offices, for outdoor space. They have accessories. It's, uh, you know, I, you, I'm like a broken record because I, I can't do the little spiel for them without mentioning my two favorite things. Okay. I know you guys, the favorite things are the beautiful furniture. I get that. But me, my two favorite things are that the trade account division is staffed by interior designers. And I say this to you all the time because it's so much more effective, isn't it? When you deal with somebody as a customer service rep who actually understands that it is important to deliver things on time and that when somebody tells you something is in stock, it should be in stock. And if God forbid there's a mistake and it's not, that they're not like, what's the big deal? That they get it and they move and they react because they've been boots on the ground like you. Okay. And then of course, my other you know favorite thing about them is the absolute unbelievable return policy that they have and it's just not to be missed so they just make it so easy so that you don't feel like you're cornered because you've ordered something and your client doesn't like it it's just so so easy so please go ahead open your trade account today at welldesign.article.com all righty let's meet sarah Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hello. How are you? I'm great. And I'm going to give you, you know, like cred right off the bat here, Sarah, because I'm very impressed by you and I haven't even had a full-blown conversation with you yet. <laughs> 
It's the truth. I have to say that at, thankfully at this stage of the podcast, I am getting lots of inquiries every single week on, you know, sure would love to be on your podcast and lots of PR reps that are saying, hey, I've got these three clients or this client that wants to be, on, that I'd love to put on your podcast. And of course you came to me through your PR rep, Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, Austin, is, what's the name of his firm? Um, Austin Mill PR. Right. Okay. I wasn't sure if 100% of it was his name. So Austin yes. Mill PR. And um, of course, I know Austin from back when he was with Andrew Joseph PR, who is also an, a great friend of mine. Um, but the thing about it is, is that it's funny. And this is where I want to give you some um, you know, props because Austin says to me, Hey, Luann, Sarah Winchester is an amazing interior photographer, you know, thinks she'd be perfect for your show, blah, blah, blah. And I have to be wary and careful for my audience, right? So I don't want to mm -hmm. have the same. Now I'm all for having the same topic over and over again, because I know one person says it a different way and we get a different little flip uh, switch that gets flipped and we go, huh, didn't think about that. So I'm all about it, but I got to know what you're doing differently to with the subject. And so I said to him, I said, well, Austin, I'd love to meet Sarah. I said, but let me tell you, I've interviewed Stephen Carlish, and that was episode 369 for those of you listening. I've interviewed David Livingston, who was episode 51. I can't see that far. Maybe it was 59 <laughs> for those listening. And Raquel Langworthy, in which was 343. And I said, Austin, if Sarah would love to be on the show, I'd love to have her, but have her listen to these three episodes and let me know what she brings to the table differently. And my my goodness, lady, you sure did your homework, <laughs> and I am so impressed. I got this huge document with this complete outline, and so good for you because oh. that's the truth, right? You need, I know that I can have more than one interview with a photographer, but I do need to know ahead of time why the listener should tune in again, right? Yeah. And so yeah. good for you. Well, thank you. Yes, I got a little carried away, but um, – <laughs> I, get, I, I like an organized outline. It's, it's well, and it's a shot list too for, for shoots. It's great to have a shot list. You need to know what you're doing coming into it to make sure you get everything that you want. And then things evolve and things change when you're on, on your shoot, but it's, you got to have a script. You got to have a shot list of where to start to know where you're going. Well, and I thought, as a matter of fact, it's funny that you say that because that's sort of what my brain said when I saw this um, complete outline with seven talking points and the sub talking point talking points under them i have to tell you beyond the content and reading it and being pleased that i knew that this could be a terrific interview and a value to interior designers to listen to it um even you know we've covered the topic here and there my next thought was oh you see you want somebody organized li like this that's doing your interiors you don't <laughs> want that crazy pants person that's all over and you know like how i roll into a room and it's like a hurricane right <laughs> yeah. so so good for you and i love it so so here's the thing let's i, I have to just say i think it's really funny and i'm going to share this with you um, and of course you have said to me that you listen to the show. So I know that you know this to be true, but you as an interiors photographer, I got to feel like are in a pretty nice sweet spot right now. Um, and, and you and the rest of your colleagues, because I feel like it has the, the, the world of interiors photography has just gotten so much recognition over the last several years. So, of course, we always know that the big time firms have always invested in interiors photography. No question. But I feel like over the last several years, I know my own experience when I ask designers, give us your best tips, your best advice for designers starting out. You know, eight out of ten will say invest in professional photography, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's big. It is. And the thing is, what's so funny is, I, in the beginning when I first started hearing this on the show, Sarah, I would say to a, photog uh, to a designer who is established, maybe they were in business 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and that would be the tip. I'd say, okay, but I mean, if I'm in business one year, 
am I really going to put aside three grand, five grand, eight grand in order to have quality professional photography? And literally from the beginning, they were like, yes, yes. And so now I don't even discount it anymore. I don't even question it anymore. And of course, it's what I encourage designers to do now also is doing that. And I guess it's because the world has changed so much. Not only, you know, the opportunity to have a professional catalog of your own work, but because of all of the platforms where we can put our work now. It's not like 20 years ago where if you were getting it photographed, it it wasn't even for your website 20 years ago for crying out loud. It was specifically to pitch. So I think it's interesting because so many industries are marginalized or negatively affected by the onset of the internet and all the social media platforms and stuff. But you guys have been really positively affected, would you say? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I mean, it's... It's created so much opportunity for, you know, me to say, starting out, I I shot anything and everything. And I really enjoyed interiors photography personally and the vibe of it and the people in it. And I was able to be like, hey, this is just what I want to do. I don't want to shoot fashion or portraits. I really like this. And I've been able to make a business out of it and lots of other colleagues, even just in my little metro area and also for designers who want to show their work you can look big time if you have (laughs) amazing photographs and just instagram and a website like that's all you kind of need to start but there is definitely through all these social media platforms the bar has been raised as to you have to have good imagery you have to show yourself the way you want to be seen and a blurry iphone photo isn't always going to cut it these days. Right, right, right. And the thing is, I have um, relationships and friendships with designers that I know that this investment in professional photography has helped set their brand new businesses up for success. I'm thinking of uh, Sarah Lynn Brennan as as a prime example of it. As the time we're recording this, she hasn't even hit her two-year anniversary in business. And I think I saw a post by her the other day that she just got her sixth feature in a print publication. Like, fabulous. think about that. Like, yeah. think about that. And that's because she has listened to experts like yourself and her colleagues that are ahead of her in the business uh, side of design that are more experienced designers tell her over and over that this investment is worthwhile. So, so we're going to talk about this now. So the thing mm-hmm. about it is, is my question is, we tell them all the time, you know, set aside budget, set aside, you know, marketing money, set aside some put something in the project, you know, put it in a piggy bank, whatever you got to do to leave money at the end to take the pictures. But the first step is finding that photographer, right? Is like, what yeah. are we, how do we do that? What are your suggestions and what are your thoughts around that? Well, having someone in your area is great and having a relationship with them. And, and like you said, first off, finding them, the greatest is Instagram, social media, and going to other designers in your area that you like, admire, seeing who shoots their work, or just, you know, networking at local events. And then you have to, I mean, I love sitting down and meeting with someone in person and talking with them. Worst case, a phone call. But as a designer, put yourself in your client's shoes, and now you're the client looking for a professional, you have to have a groove with them. You have to like their style. First of all, there's, you know, everyone has a different style of photography. I approach things through my experiences and my education and, and my lens, literally, and, you know, a colleague photographer could look at the same room and do something totally different. And so you have to like their style And then you also have to like them. Photo shoots are amazing, fun, creative days, but they are long and hard Mm. and exhausting and mentally and then styling. And there's so much that goes into it. And of course, we make it look all cool and sexy on Instagram when you have these behind the scenes (laughs) videos for your stories and there's music playing and and it is fun. And I I mean, I do what I do because I love it, but know that you are going to be like, a shell of yourself when you get home and all <laughs> that is a glass of wine and 
the couch. <laughs> right, 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 right. So you, you better like who you're hanging out with those days, those, um, those long hours too. So I have a question for you in there. So when you say that you should like their style, obviously you're going to go to the photographer's Instagram feed and their website and so forth like that. But that's interesting to me because I would not have, I would not have thought, like I would have thought that if I didn't like a particular photographer's Instagram feed, I wouldn't, I don't know, and, and by the way, I can't imagine not liking it. Like not liking it is way too much of a word, but say right. not preferring it or not being moved by it or whatever. But I don't know that if I thought about it intellectually that I would attribute it to the photographer, I might have attributed to the designer's work that the photographer was taking. So where is the nudge in there of the photographer style that I should be on the lookout for? How do I discern that, Sarah? Through, um, like, basically lighting and framing, which are kind of, kind of the two biggies of photography. And, and if you're searching through someone's portfolio and say you like a style in, in a magazine that you flip through and you're, that you're totally jamming with that, and there's light coming through the windows and they don't kind of block it out, or if you, I mean, I'm, I'm getting kind of technical, you know, I can tell when someone's used ambient lighting and, and I use it sometimes too, but going through their work and if it has a vibe that you want your work to look like and, okay. and the framing, or if, if it's kind of these wider angle, full room shots and you want that, your work to be seen like that. I mean, I work with my clients with what they what they want. I like to frame things up a little more, what I call editorial, and, and it gets a feel of the room. But I also will go back and take a full room shot because sometimes you do need those informational shots that are just kind of be on your portfolio. They, they're not going to necessarily be in a magazine or even on your Instagram, but they're great tools for when you're sitting down with a client being like, see how this is how I put the sofas and the chairs and this is how we arrange the room. But then you have those other shots that really get the vibe of the design, the architecture, the feel is of if you are in that room. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that answered your yeah, question. Yeah, a little bit. I think <laughs> it sounds like to me it's a little gut intuition too. Maybe oh, yeah. it's sort of maybe we can't necessarily – identify it with language the way you could or with technique the way you could but you're saying if at first glance you're just not even jiving and vibing with what you're seeing then move on and find somebody else because that's like right. you're right okay so it's, it's like what if you go and they have like all the lights on and they shoot with lights on and you don't want lights off I mean you want lights off then you're going to be fighting all day with that photographer. They're going to be wanting to turn on the lights and you're going to want to be to turn okay. them off where I'm the opposite. I like to shoot without the, the lights on and I've worked with architects and I'm always like, okay, we'll do one with it on and one with it <laughs> off. And, and we, and we vibe that way. And it's, you know, I mean, it's not a huge deal, but just know being aware of their work and you're not going to totally change somebody's style, but they'll be able to work with you too. Okay. 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 It's sort of like you said, it's like when a potential client is looking for an interior designer, you know, mm -hmm. the overall look should be something that you feel resonates with you. And beyond that, there's going to be a little give and take here and there when you get down to the actual selections. And so you're saying some give and take when you get onto the shoot site, but for the most part, you have a way that you like doing things. Yeah, well, and, and when a client's looking for a designer, if they love a layered traditional look, they're not going to hire um, a designer with a very modern portfolio. Right. It's right. Um, like Un that. Understood. Okay. Okay. And then the thing is, too, I, I know that you mentioned to me that you have a lot of photographer friends in your area there in Boston, and you know that a lot of them are listening. What do you guys say to each other and about how to differentiate, differentiate yourselves to designers? Because I think that sort of information might be helpful for us when we're looking for you. Yeah, I think it is, I mean, some of it's probably price for sure. Okay, I, um, okay. When, when people drill down to that, um, again, I think it's style. I think it's who you want to work with. It's a working relationship. I, I find if you find someone that you work well with, I like repeat clients because then 
their website looks cohesive and consistent and they haven't used five different photographers over the course of a couple of years. And, and when someone goes on their website, they're not distracted by that. They're just looking at the designer's work and instead of oh, this looks totally different. And so I guess among us as colleagues, and we're all pretty friendly, which is great, especially when you work for yourself and you kind of have this small, quiet work life, you need colleagues to bounce ideas and questions Mm. off of like, hey, I had this issue or where did you get that tripod? And is it better than this one I had? And, (laughs) um, And that kind of shop talk too. Right. So I don't know if we particularly differentiate ourselves among each other or among our clients, but you just kind of find a groove. And, and if I have a, someone come to me that I know has been working with a friend photographer of mine, I will call them and be like, Hey, is this cool? I don't, you know, I, I don't want anyone to ever think I'm poaching their clients because it, there is that relationship there. There is that, yes, it's business, but we have a very personal business in the design world. I feel, right. um, so yeah no okay interesting all good stuff i love it so when we talk about you know creating these photographs and taking these photo shoots and being on them is there you mentioned the one shot is the larger full room shot is an informational shot and you use that when you're going through your portfolio with a client and then the smaller shots the vignettes are more for highlighting a detail in XYZ. Are there ways to look at photography that the end result f- photo is going to be taken different or styled differently depending on where it's being used? So, okay, you know, Sarah, I need X amount of photographs for my website or Sarah, I need X amount of photographs because I need to fill the inst- feed the Instagram Instagram beast for the next, you know, 90 billion years. So, yeah. do you know, is it is it two different objectives when you're shooting, shooting for one platform or over another? Or is it take all the pictures you can and then use them however you want? It's, of course, the answer, you know, uh, an evolution of both. I try to, at minimum, when I'm going to a room, depending on the, upon the size, get at least three shots. One that I is that informational. I don't consider it very sexy or cool, but it's sometimes it does the job. Sometimes that full room shot is one of those great straight on elevations that you see on the cover of magazines and it and it just works that way. Um, I have started to evolve the way I shoot, gosh, and even in the past couple of months because of this need for more data, this, this desire for more photographs in that, you know, we'll shoot the house or the room and then I'll go back kind of as we're tidying up and get those more kind of Instagram shots, if you will, for lack of a better term to just because people do want more data and that's kind of that's a response to my client having a different need or the needs changing and me having to change with their needs i also really encourage um i know we were saying as a photographer you shouldn't tell people to go around and shoot with their iphone but i do all the time there it's a very powerful camera and it takes great photos if you have the the right lighting and then the right um stuff going on and at a photo shoot we typically do so I encourage my clients to go around behind me or as we're setting up different things and and go to town the room is never going to look more the way that they want it than at that time at the photo shoot so you you should get as much out of it as you can and that includes videos of of us doing stuff I've also started doing um taking lots of different photos and, and keeping kind of the the wrong photos of us styling and the evolution of an image when it's on my tripod and then compiling it into a GIF afterwards so we can have these like animated images that you can put on social media that give that behind the curtain feel of of what your work is like and what you're like and, and just that extra dimension to the material that you have. Okay, so what you're saying is, is that when this room is as pretty as it's ever going to look in this moment in time, and you've got your camera set up for, and your lighting set up for the professional picture that you're going to take, you're saying to your client, 
it's okay for you to take all these pictures with your iPhone. And I know you're going to end up using a lot of this for that social media beast. So it's not this icky thing like, uh, excuse me, uh, you're paying me to do these photographs. If you're going to follow me and take all the, so you're like giving that you're saying, let's do that. Right. Absolutely. I, um, I think it's great because they can, I also find, I mean, people, you can get great shots, but then it, in a weird way, it also really validates why they have me there because yeah. Yeah. Then it's they never going to be as good. Right. Then they can see what I'm doing with my big SLR and the details that I can get. And, the, and it's, they complement each other. Yeah. And like I say, you're investing this time and money on this shoot. You might as well get as much out of it as you possibly can. Yeah. I like that, um, that way of looking at it, Sarah, because, you know, I haven't done a lot of professional interior photography shoots in my lifetime here but you know we've all been at the events with the weddings and different things and the professional photographer is you can see them visibly feathers ruffled when he or she has stylized a whole shoot of the entire family and there's you know you know aunt mabel going let me get a picture too before you leave (laughs) and like you see the face and in one hand you think all right fine i get it you're the pro but it's like you're getting paid and it's never going to look way you made it so what do you what's your problem and so I get I'm glad that right. you know what I mean so that's awesome I like that and then um so the the difference the so in your mind when you're there are you you're you're telling me you're taking you're thinking of progression shots behind the scene shots you're thinking of all of those for social media but then the others you're picturing for you know face forward Exactly. And, and pitching to magazines and in, in hopes that they'll run the images we took that day, or they're used as scouting. And, and then we go back and, and some magazines want to style it the way that has kind of their touch on it. So you need those almost like, com- not almost completely professional style photos to even pitch to magazines and a lot of the regional ones around us will take those as shot but we've gotten to you know we have that relationship and I kind of know what they like or I go into a project and we've scouted it and my mind's already kind of starting to to think like where would this fit where could we get this because I do again you have spent all this time and money on a photo shoot let's get the most out of it let's get it printed in a a publication let's get it on social media. Sometimes you got to hold back on social media because you've agreed to the publication. There's that bit of a dance, but, um, like go big or go home. Why are you doing this to then just hide it away on your website? Right, 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 right. So we have other things that we're going to talk about the styling and getting to the good shot and all that, but I would love to like jump over to copyright and who owns the images. And I'll tell you why, because I have at live events, people have come up to me like passionately (laughs) saying, you haven't addressed this on your show. You don't talk about copyright. This is a big thing. You know what I mean? And so, so let's have the conversation. Tell me about copyright versus usage, right? Mm -hmm. You know, all of this stuff. Let's have this. Yeah, and it can be really confusing. It's and inst- it is. It, that can be, Sarah. It is okay. I'm just going to tell you, it, it can is be confusing. Straight up. <laughs> well, and that's and I I don't get upset when my clients are confused by it because that's my job. It's this is this is my realm to know this, not theirs. It's like their clients being like, "How do you know all these fabric selections?" Well, that's their job. That's in right. their Rolodex of their um, of their education. So. A copyright is the um, basically owning the image and and all the rights in which to copy it. So when I hit my shutter, take an image, the creator of that image automatically owns the copyright. Copyrights are transferable. Um, When I worked for a corporation and I was their in-house photographer, it was a part of my salary, a part of my contract that anything I took, the copyright was owned by the company. Now that I am my own company, any image I take is the copyright is owned by me. Typically, you know, 99% of the time in my usage, in my agreement with my clients, I give them 
unlimited usage. And I've taken out the word usage rights. I've taken out the word right in that because I think that's where it's like copyright, usage right. I Mm. say copyright and then usage just to hopefully um, try to delineate that a little bit. And what usage means is they can do it for anything that's coming directly from them, their Instagram, their website, any printed marketing material, any advertising um, advertisements that they take out in magazines, where the, the question of, okay, I am pitching this to a magazine, you're the designer pitching it to a magazine, and the magazine says, yes, we want to use these images, go, then and most publications do this automatically, then they go to the the owner of the copyright, the photographer, to then pay them usage in this third party or in this additional way. Um, I could go on, but oh, I want no, to no, no. Okay, I'm I'm digesting first. it. So let's just matter of fact, let's just recap it. So I like that you do not use the word usage rights, and I'm going to tell you why because. I don't know that if I heard copyright and usage rights that to your point that I wouldn't have thought that they meant the same thing. Even though I know the words have actual technical root differences in their meetings. Okay. But I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known clearly that it isn't just a, you know, a fancy industry way to say copyrights, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what I, I think what your point is, is that it's, it's gray to people who don't do it for a living. So I like copyright versus usage, very clear, okay? And what you're saying is, is if I have hired you to take the pictures of my room that I design and you transfer to me, you said 99% of the time. So I'm gonna recap what I understood and then you're gonna tell me about that 1%. But Mm -hmm. you transfer to me usage rights and I said when I say transfer I buy them I've paid you and now you give me usage rights right and so that means I can use it on my website use it in my Facebook use it in my IG use it in my LinkedIn if I want to run an ad in a paper I can use it if I want to make a brochure for my company I can use it but if I want to get published in a magazine that's where the line stops and that at that point typically though it would be the responsibility of the magazine publisher to then reach out to you and buy their usage of those photographs. Exactly, yes. And so I can't transfer, in other words, the clarity here is because I've got usage rights, I can't transfer those usage rights to a magazine. Only you as the photographer can do that. Exactly. So the owner of the copyrights can transfer usage, right? Not the person, the not someone already having usage. Okay. And so, who are the one percent that you're not giving usage rights to with the transaction of the contract? It it is those who negotiate. Well, I want full copyright, and so, uh-huh. like I said, when I was a salaried employee, being an in-house photographer, it was in my you know, salary contract when now as a, um, a business owner, it's that 1%. And so typically then I charge a higher rate for the photo shoot and for the images because I am giving away all the copyright and I no longer have control over those images. Then the owner of that copyright can use it. So it's typically like when a magazine would hire me outright to do it. And then, um, you know, Architectural Digest will own those photos and I can't use them on my website without asking or without getting usage then from Architectural Digest or or whoever. And so those situations, the photographer usually just charges a higher rate knowing that they're never going to be able to, you know, one day you publish a book, you can't use those because they're owned by a different agency. Okay. 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 Understood. Okay. I get it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. So, so what is, 
let's say somebody has paid you, and I don't know if you can answer this question, and, but if somebody's paid you $3,000 for a photo shoot, and now it is going to go to a magazine and the magazine wants to purchase usage rights. What, what is, is that like another three grand? Is that 500? Like what is the, and even if it's different for every photographer, is there a typical ratio? Do you know what I'm saying? Based on your initial fee? Yeah, it usually actually depends on the publication. Mm. They, they're the ones that dictate their usage payment. Um, and I've, I've never negotiated it. It's usually per image, um, that's interesting. Her, yeah. You own it, but they dictate the terms. You know, yeah, it, and it's <laughs> okay. Binary. I'm going to gather all the photographers up in the world. Let's have a totally. little conversation well, about negotiation skills, folks. <laughs> totally, right. Well, it, I mean, it depends on. So, like, I had an image in InStyle, and they paid X amount for a quarter size, quarter page size image. Maybe it was half. I forget. And then. In style, Ukraine wanted to redo that. This is a true story. Wanted to use that image as well, but In Style Ukraine has a much lower circulation okay. than In Style USA. So they're going to pay a lo lower usage because usage is usually paid, and and that's why it's like it's not a negotiating tool. It kind of goes back to advertising. How many eyes are on it? So a regional magazine is going to have a different usage payment than a national publication because there aren't as many eyes on it. Okay. And of, yes, it does. And of course, none of this has to do with interior designers because they don't have to pay this. But, <laughs> exactly. you know, I just get down these rabbit holes because I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I have a lot of interior photographers listening. Yeah. Well. Okay, good. <laughs> so it's, we're it's serving somebody little... right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, look, I would still be willing to, you know, argue a little bit in there. That's almost like it's I have to just tell you to just round that out. It's almost like publications have decided the rate for for each level of eyeballs and they all band together and they all do the same thing and so you can't say anything about it <laughs> yes, price fixing, yeah yeah that's what it sounds like to me it's like what <laughs> because i mean honestly you've done the work and if you as if interiors i guess what it comes down to is if you're a highly successful photographer and yes, okay, InStyle US wants it and the next person is InStyle Ukraine, you know, I guess you could say no because AD is calling you next, right? You don't right. have to say yes to them. But it just Absolutely. seems to me like most of us earn our living based on our value not the value of the price. It's like to me, you know, honestly, it sounds like right. an interior designer all day long trying to tell me, well, she can only afford a $1,000 sofa, so I'm going to have to sell her the $2,000 for $1,000. I'm like, no, sweetie, she doesn't get it. She doesn't get right. the $2,000 sofa then. And basically, you know, you're saying as photographers, if the magazine only will pay X amount of what, that's it. That's all you get. So you, ha you have to understand how my brain just is like exploding on that. <laughs> right, right. Well, and of course, and, I have and... many friends in the in the publication industry, Design New Jersey, Ren Miller. I love them. Adam Japko from uh, <laughs> New Esteem Media. I love them. Yeah. So, you know, this is no diss on you guys, but whoa, what a nice little racket you got going. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just so excited to be in a publication. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. The yeah, that's what it is. They're like, you want it in, so here's what I'll pay you. And it's like, my brain's like, what? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, a little rabbit hole there. Okay, all right. So, second and third party usage is exactly that when that magazine or that publication comes along and wants to use it. Okay, right. So, are there other people that designers have to think about from their standpoint of you know what it is? It's this making sure that as interior designers that we're in the in following the rules. I had a situation, you know, Sandra Funk, House of Funk, we're so thrilled and glad that we're her interior window treatment vendor. And her photographer is Mark Weinberg out of New York City. And he is amazing. I mean, he's an mm -hmm. excellent photographer. Um, and he does all her work. And I, you know, you know, I'm out here. I don't understand this stuff, right? So, you know, one day she she puts a post up there, and um, you know, the people for, who work for me that are doing our uh, Instagram and so forth like that, you know, we start reposting it to Windowworks. Hey, and we're tagging House of Funk, and we're giving her the cred all day long for the design, but you know, like right over our head to credit Mark, okay? Right. And you know, he called me up, and he, on no certain terms, was like, "Lady." 
<laughs> pull it down. <laughs> and I was like, what? I'm like, isn't this good for you? He's like, no. <laughs> okay. And so, so then I ended up paying him usage rights is what yeah. it does. I said, well, I want to keep doing it. Why shouldn't people see your work? He's like, great, then pay for it. And so I had a little education. So get us down that because this is what we need to learn. Yeah, so the, the theory is if you are using an image to make money, it's someone's own, someone owns that image. You, sh- you need to pay them because you are making money off of that image. You know, Instagram is one of those kind of Wild West still where people can take a screen grab and they can share it and it's tiny and the resolution doesn't matter to a point um, as it would in a, in a print publication. But, you know, asking yourself as, if you're posting an image on your social media did you take the image? If you didn't, who did? And is it your work as a designer? And if it's not, who did? And, and it's, you know, giving everyone on who made that credit or a builder, if you know all that information, I'm of the camp, the more the merrier. Give everyone credit where credit is due. It's not going to discount the work you did. And I can't like track down everyone on Instagram who's shared a photo of mine, right. who's making money, and and I just don't have the time for that. But if I do see something on, you know, say like again for example, an Etsy shop or something else that's used using it, I will ping them and say, hey, you know, I I just just always come from a place assuming people didn't know. Right. You know, it's not coming from a place of malice or they're trying to steal my photograph it's like this is great no idea this was my image and what do you yeah yes and and like we said just at the very beginning what most the people don't know what is copyright what is usage and i i just assume people are coming from a place and if there is a sliding scale if it bothers me then i will say something and certainly if it is a, a large company who's making money off my image like, well, hey, you have the budget to do that. You should do that. It's, right, right, um, right. But if it's a blogger who just likes the thing and is sharing it and they're not really monetizing off of it or maybe through like reward style, maybe they're monetizing off of it. I guess you could get nitty gritty, but um, there is that sliding scale. And then in turn, I want to like scooch back to the copyright. The the work that, that I shoot is someone else's work. So in that yeah. world of photography, kind of strange that my work is based on someone else's work but I've framed it in this way and I've made it look the best that it can so that's my creation so I put in my contract and this is not a copyright law but this is just kind of my law I guess (laughs) I won't sell that image to anyone without the designer's permission Mm. so a, a cabinet company or a wallpaper or lighting or whoever sees the image, loves it, wants to use it for their marketing. I always make sure that it's okay with the designer because I've had cases where the designer ended the relationship and it wasn't super great. Or they're just like, no, I really don't want, or my client homeowner's not comfortable with it. You just have to look at with anything with a home, there's always so many people involved. I won't sell a photograph if my client is not okay with it even though they don't own the copyright and they don't get right a piece of that usage payment I just I value that relationship more than I would a couple extra hundred bucks from you know whatever vendor I'm glad you brought that up because I want to go down for that to for a minute but I also just realized and I want to clarify in case Mark is listening is (laughs) where I also crossed the line was we had it we had the images on our website and mm-hmm. as you were talking, I remember when you were starting to say, look, if it's Instagram and this and that and the other thing. And I remember him saying, look, if it was just the Instagram, I might have let it go. But you've got it on your website. And so the thing was to us, we credited Sandra Funk on the website. We're like, this is a featured designer. This is her work. And so we were all about crediting her. But I was oblivious to the next step of crediting him. And his schooling me was 
even if you had credited me, he goes, Instagram, Facebook, I might have lived with it. But on your website, that's where you're doing business. That was his exact mm-hmm. thing. He goes, you got to pay me. And so I just want to make sure I clarify and don't like he wasn't, you know, out of his mind because of a, a one Instagram post. It was we were featuring it on our actual website. Now, the other thing is I just want to say this, too. And I think this is interesting because this is where I get my back up a little bit. You are saying your personal ethics it's not a law, it's, it's a Sarah law that if a brand wants a photograph that you took to use, you won't sell it to that brand without checking with the interior designer. Because, you know, I remember, oh my goodness, 25, 20, I don't know, 20 years ago, a, an interior designer, something came up, we were on a project of hers, And I knew the photographer that she typically worked with. And I said to her, my goodness, when so-and-so gets in here, this is going to be outstanding by the time we're finished with this. You know, you're finished doing all your stuff and our drapes go up and everything. And she said, she goes, no, I won't use them anymore. And I Mm -hmm. said, oh, what do you mean? And she said, well, she goes, I opened up this. And I think it was a tile magazine, a trade tile publication. And there was a bathroom that she had designed. And there it was in an ad and said nothing about her being the designer. And, Mm. you know, she called up the photographer and the point of view was, I own the copyright. And it was like crazy to me because, you know, designers are supposed to go completely out of their way to make sure, even I found, like Mike Von Tassel has took all the pictures of Luann live. And the first couple of posts, I was like, my God, we're not crediting Mike. We're not crediting Mike. And then all of a sudden I'm saying, wait a second, Irina, um, Leone has taken every single headshot of mine. We put my headshot out there like it's like a freaking bad penny. <laughs> I said, and we never say it's Irina. Like all of a sudden it's like, what's going on here? Right. And so the yeah. thing is we are, to me, it's only recently that I'm starting to be heightened and to remember, yes, Irina Leone took this picture of me. You know, when you compliment me on it, I go, oh my God, right. Tell, tell them it's Irina. But Nobody seems to care about the designer either. And you do. I'm hearing that you do. But you also know that that is not the normal, is it? No, it's not. I, I, it's not. <laughs> I know. And it makes me mad. Yeah. <laughs> well, and when I, when people share things on Instagram or I, I went and I do sell something to someone and it's been agreed upon, I do say in the agreement with the third party they have to credit the designer and nice. and maybe this is just the next evolution with mm. visual awareness and stuff cultural yeah becoming so we're becoming so much more visual with social media outlets which i'm like getting sick of saying that word <laughs> I, <laughs> know. We, I feel like we say it all the time but we live in such a visual world that who goes into making one of these images is becoming more known and and so I think maybe it's just the way things are going to go. I don't know. It's the way I'm going. I I hope it is. And I I appreciate you that you take the high road and that you understand that it is the ethical thing to do because any photographer, you know, your talent notwithstanding, okay, any photographer that wants to tell me that, yes, I get I hear you, Sarah. You frame it. You do the lighting. We all know the sun is shining in and you make it amazing and not look like this crazy pants, you know, hot mess of white light, right? So I get that. But if it was is just that that talent that created the gorgeous picture then you know you could go into Bob's furniture store and take pictures all day long right but you right. can't do that you need the high level design you need that designer that has put the room together properly to begin with for you to have as the base of what you're then going to do and capture cuz let's be serious it's your talent that captures that beauty the beauty didn't exist, mm-hmm. right? Abs- yeah, Somebody abs- else created it and you're capturing it. And that is a valuable talent that not everybody can do. But somehow, you know, so many photographers think it's okay to let that go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm so glad I'm railing on photographers after you told me how many are listening to the show. It's like, Luann, shut up. <laughs> and I like to, to say, you know, I'm also, I know you said capture. It's like I'm like semantics, but I like to, think I'm creating the photograph of this already beautifully created okay. room as opposed to just capturing is like putting up your iPhone and okay. capturing it. We sit with our tripod and our laptop and, and tweak yes. things to quarter of an inches. And maybe this is coming from my fine art, see fartsy 
background where I did, I learned on film and I had a big large format camera and we created these images which were labor intensive and lovely, but um, yeah, no, I don't mean to <laughs> underestimate your value with the word right. capture. I really, truly no, no. do not. And I really am not denigrating the the, the industry at all. Um, but I think to your point is that in a world that has become so absolutely inundated with images that this is the new conversation, right? That, okay, just because it was the law of the land, does it mean it's right? Does it mean it's ethical? And, you know, to your point, what does it take to, to make a phone call? And the other thing too is how many times have I had an interior designer say to me, you know, my clients are, you know, they're of such a level that they don't want their work shared. And so how do you handle that, Sarah, when you own the copyright? So, so, so let's talk about the designer at the top of the food chain, right? Mm -hmm. That's working with those clients that are like, no, I'm sorry, you're not putting my stuff all over the world. I don't, this is, you want to, they, non-disclosures, right? Designers are often required to do non-disclosures, but in those situations, I have to believe that the designer is still photographing that work, even if it's only for their own private portfolio or if it's for when they're going to put a book out someday, because we are talking about that level interior designer. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Is it is it that at that such level that the client, not your designer client, but the end user consumer client of the designer has such clout and the job is prestigious that they're dictating the terms now and they're saying, okay, yes, I will pay you more money because I want to own these copyrights. Like, how do we get around? What, what are we looking at at that world, that pool that people? Oh, yeah. Um, and I've shot homes like that where actually the homeowner didn't demand that, but they should. And again, like going into it with the designer, they said it to her, but their paperwork with me essentially wouldn't be in order. Right. But I understand that with my designer and I'm okay with that. And, you know, again, pro we probably should have gone back and had a contract that this will never be, but I'm of the mindset that, I mean, I know that and I'm not going to do that, but if a designer has that level client, they want to shoot it. They need to make sure in their contract with the photographer that the photographer knows that they can't share it. And then the photographer may came, come back and say, well, then, I'm going to require a higher rate and, and there's that conversation and, and these it's, they're not bad conversations to have, but anytime no. these ones, they do get a little kind of nerve wracking or, but know what you don't know and ask the question. And then it begins this back and forth conversation that can happen. And it doesn't get to the point where those images do go out on social media, the homeowner client sees it and gets upset mm -hmm. and then it goes down that way and you don't want it to ever, cause I remember something you said, you know, do I want to be right or do I want to get what I want? Exactly. And if the designer wants to get images of this home that they can share privately even, and I've, I've shot houses like that, that even I can only share privately, but when I'm meeting with an editor of a magazine, I'm like, I really want you to see this awesome one because it really show, shows off my work. Here it is as a good old fashioned printed portfolio that you can look at, but. But yes, <laughs> right. I'm way. not emailing you a Dropbox link to it that you can, you know, dis be disrespect what I've said. I'm showing you a hard copy picture of it, right? Exactly. Yes. And again, I go into everything thinking, the best of everyone and that if something happens it's a true mistake but I also back into it knowing that this mistake could happen so protect myself on the forefront of in the way of sharing um well it's, it's like, the premise of of every good business transaction that the details are hammered out at the beginning before the emotions are involved you mm -hmm. see, that's the whole, that's the key with everything. It's the key with setting up a consultation with a, a new a potential client. It's the key to setting up a photo shoot. You know, it's the key to setting up the beginning of the agreement with the client who is an exclusive client and is going to require, um, I was going to say DNRs, do not resuscitate. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we need that. NDRs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't need DNRs with our clients. No. <laughs> um, NDRs with our clients. But the thing about right. that is, is to not just, 
just sign it. If you if you have your first interaction with a client that's asking for a, D, a DNR here, you know, again, an NDR, <laughs> to to just go and have a conversation with the client and with your photographer and say, what does this mean? What, where are we, what, what, who, at the end of the day, who can do what with this? Because that's the time to hash it out. I love it. Mm -hmm. And so, and to your point is, it's clear your integrity is coming through. It is absolutely clear. And when we are fortunate enough to work with someone like yourself, whether it's a photographer, if it's a tile layer, if it's whoever that has integrity, then it's, it's, there's safety in that because there might be misunderstanding. There might be disagreement like with me and Mark, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. When you, when you are looking for the right solution, it's okay. But the thing is, you don't know that about everybody at the beginning. And so, so the idea of getting it clear at the beginning is what's important. Right. And yeah. I think it's great having this conversation because a lot of people, you don't know the questions that you don't know. Right. So right. bringing it out is, is great. Right, right, right. I mean, it's so funny because it's the it is true. Um, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, the half a dozen dozen times that I've interacted with professional photographers for different things over the years, I have to say, it it is always even whether they've said, oh, and you're going to have the copyrights to it, or you're going to have the usage rights to it or whatever. I always like, whatever, you're taking my picture. Let's move on. You know and what I mean? Like, and you're like, like smiling and nodding. And, yeah, yeah, because we'll I that. really <laughs> never, you know, I'm thinking back years ago, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, where I had no understanding of the nuances. But the thing about it is 15 years ago, when there really wasn't this explosion of online, if I had abused or by, by mistake or intention, a photographer's, you know, copyright laws with me, what are the chances they would have found out? You right, see, right. now it's very easy. And so the point is, is that, you know, you want to all be on the same page, whether you are, you know, intending to disrespect and, and break the rules or law with somebody, that's, that's a whole nother thing, but to right. not do it by accident, just because you don't know, right? Well, and I've, I mean, I've been scrolling through things and I see a photograph I took and I have this like sinking thing and, and I see it and it's not attributed to me or the designer. And so vice versa, I'm sure a designer seeing their work sold via the photographer somewhere else and their heart just sinking, oh, seeing yeah. it somewhere. It's, I felt it. I get it. And yeah. so I never want. Well, and that's what I was getting on my little soapbox about before. It's so funny because we've heard many times how a photographer, you know, has this sinking feeling when their work is out there not attributed to them, but they don't realize that when you're the one who owns the copyrights, if you're a photographer that has sold it to your point to a publication or to a um, brand or something, the designer has that same like, hey, what about me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I yeah. made that room for you to photograph, you know? So it is, to me, it's, I hear you, an average person with any camera no matter how beautifully designed a room is, is not going to produce a photograph that is beautifully photographed. I get that. There's no question. But I think the talents are shared. So you got to have something good to work with. <laughs> For sure, yeah. All righty. So where, where do we want to go from here? Is there anything? I mean, I knew we needed to cover this copyright um, thing. And I probably yeah. will get an email from somebody that told me I left a whole spot, part out. I don't know. Did we leave well, any part out of it? <laughs> biggest part. We are not lawyers. <laughs> we That's are not it. lawyers. There you go. Especially me. <laughs> exactly. Like anything we said consult your lawyer if, you're, if you truly have a question you um, know what sarah thank you for that because i wouldn't <laughs> have thought to say that and you definitely can't take advice from me on this <laughs> right. Right. It's, I, so we're just starting the conversation it's out there and um it's not something to be nervous about having that conversation right i love that that's really what we're saying is here's some of the nuances here's some of the places it can go off the rails here's some of the ways that you need to think about it but the biggest message is have an open dialogue with both your photographer and your consumer and move it from there so mm -hmm. um i had debbie daly on the show recently she's up by you do you know her debbie daly i don't oh I don't. you should know her she's the okay. she's first of all an interior designer more than 25 or 30 years but she's She's also the, uh, I don't remember what they call them now, but the, the I'm going to call it the in-house designer for the Boston Design Center. 
Oh, you know, the designer yeah. in residence. I, I, oh my goodness, I can't remember the name of it, but. So, oh my gosh, I, I'm like looking her up now. I've, yes. Uh, I know her face for sure. I've yes. seen yep, her. Yep, yep, very I'm well respected oh my in God, the yes. Boston area, all over the country. She speaks <laughs> on design and helps designers and, you know, she's got a book coming out in the fall and everything else. But on her show recently, she actually said that when she's on her first consult and it goes to, well, first of all, whether she signs a contract on the first consult or not, but even if she doesn't, she says, here's, all, here's a sample of what my letter of agreement looks like. Here's a this, here's a that, and here is a release form for photography because mm-hmm. she said that even on that first day, she's taking pictures with her iPhone and she wants a release from the consumer for those level pictures because she's Absolutely. been burned before not having that release, right? Yeah, and... And the, you are on their property. So there has to be that level of release too. So the minute when a um, magazine gets involved, they, even if the homeowner is not mentioned in the article, they have to get a homeowner release because it is their property. And, and that is like the first stop that if they don't want it on there, right. it doesn't ha- it can't be, it's their home. Right. Um, I don't care who owns the copyright. Exactly. of the image. Yep, so. I know. So interesting, uh, very interesting. So, all right. So here's one other topic that I want to cover that you mentioned, and I think because it's a valuable uh, topic, is this partnering with um, local um, brands and d- furniture places in order to style the project. Yes. Um, no, it's great, especially when you're trying to finish out a project and it's not every designer gets that dream, you know, we have this whole house we've been working on and there's install day and it's the surprise and, you know, we've like done everything from the custom furniture to the books on the shelf and that's kind of few and far between. It's those ones where we've, you've been working on this room or you're trying to get your client to buy a chair and borrowing things for the shoot and actually we'll even a lot of times we're on shoots and I'll have the designer take a picture of my picture on my screen and if the homeowners at work are like what do you think of this and they will buy things off of that picture of my picture Ah. while we're there on shoot and less for us to pack up and the designer gets to finish out this uh, project and the homeowner gets basically they get it for the cost that we bring it in because they get it styled for free. If you will, it's, it's like a, it's a win-win the designer's done all this shopping. I've done some shopping and styling and they don't get charged that hourly of the designer doing it because we're doing it for the photo shoot anyway. Okay. And it looks so great. And it looks even greater on my image that you could live in a photo. I mean, nobody lives in a real photo, but (laughs) we all want to. And I, have found it great making contacts with um, local studios. Elizabeth Benedict Home is like two houses down, for like two, the studio is like two doors down from my house. And mm. I will just like back in my car, see what she has new in the shop. They'll, you know, wrap it up and load it up. And, you know, half the time I sell half of it. And the other half of the time I come back with most of it and it's but it gets stuff out there and then it gets people back in their shop and it's just this kind of circular kind of community getting everybody everybody have a win Mm. So I remember Stephen Carlish talked about this on his episode he 369 he Mm. I remember him being uh, sharing a story how he was shooting a nursery and he came in and all the pieces were in place and it was so beautiful. And then as they were cleaning up when the photo shoot was go- was over, all of the stuff leaving. And he was like, whoa, like like something like 75% of the stuff actually <laughs> wasn't part of the, the, the actual final design, right. right? And he was like, and he just, that one really particularly, instead of just finishing out a few pieces, it sort of like made the whole room, right? So, but the question is, is in the nuts and bolts in that, because I know designers are thinking, okay, do you just walk into Elizabeth Benedict's studio and say, hey, 
I'm an interior designer. Of course, you're doing it as the photographer, but you're also suggesting that the designers should be doing this as well, is developing these relationships with local businesses and saying, you know, often I will not have the luxury of doing a design to completion. And I would love to be able to, you know, highlight the products and the, you know, items that you have by having them in my photo shoots. Okay. So the question is, is we just walk in point blank and ask and, you know, knock on doors until somebody says, that sounds like a great idea even though five people might be like i'm not giving you my stuff for free like wh- yeah. what 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 are you um i mean as my mother would always say what's the worst thing they can right. do i'm say there no. too <laughs> i'm not there too <laughs> yeah they could say no and then you say well thank you and um the people that are open to it like my um friend elizabeth are are super open to it and that's how i, I mean a ton of designers now know that she is like the go to place and she orders she has the accounts with all these um vendors that one designer isn't going to open up a two's company account to for, to you know supply their handful of clients they can go to elizabeth and she's already shopped it she has it in her store mm-hmm. they can take it all on approval do up the the house um for installation or even for a rejuge before the holidays or, you know, guests are coming. And if the family likes it, they keep it. If not, they'll bring it back to the studio. And, and again, I do it for photo shoots and designers. Absolutely. It's, it's a great way to get stuff. That's also not, I mean, we all have home goods and it has amazing stuff, but it can also be very hit or miss. It's a, it's a, another step above that. Right. Is when you find a local retailer who is actually has an eye and is really curating Mm -hmm. a beautiful um, collection in our showroom. But so the question is, what about in the, in the murky details? So it's one Mm -hmm. thing you walk in and you pick up a half a dozen pillows and some candlesticks, but when you want a chair and you want this and you want that, are, 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 are you paying the retailer to, in other words, are you hiring either you or the designer hiring somebody? I heard you, you, you pull up with your car, but I got to believe there's things that you're not capable of driving away with. So right. is the retailer supposed to look at that like, hey, this is my shot to sell this stuff. So I will cover the delivery um, and expenses. Or are you expected as the designer to not incur, you know, have that retailer incur any cost of this unless they, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, th- I guess it depends on the, the piece, the size of the piece. You know, an occasional chair, most designers I know have enormous SUVs. You can throw <laughs> an occasional chair in there, you know, a hutch or something like that would, would take a little bit more. And, you know, not to keep using Elizabeth as an example, she will hope you get it delivered. I don't know the nitty gritty details of like who pays for that delivery mm-hmm. and who pays mm-hmm. or if it's then incorporated into the cost of the piece. Um, I haven't borrowed a piece that big, but I think again, going back to just like opening up the conversation right. and asking, and if you're not comfortable with paying for the delivery, maybe being like, would you split it with me? And again, right. what's the worst they can do is say yeah. no. Right. Exactly. And, um, or but otherwise you you're setting or... yourself up for, this is not like, Hey, 10 minutes before let's do this. Oh, right, right. <laughs> you know, no. if you're going to do it yourself, you're going to go make multiple trips back and forth. Maybe the chair goes in one trip, but then three lamps and a rug go in another trip. And then there's a whole yada, yada, yada. So it's a big and deal. You break a it, you buy it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. You break it, you buy it kind of thing. For and sure. that's yeah. the other thing. If you break it, you buy it. Right. So that's the other thing. But I I do, do you find that, is it 50% of the shoots that you go on are utilizing local retailers for filling out the projects or 10% or 90%? Is it more often or less often? It's become more often for me because I I think I've kind of built a reputation for that in a weird way because it started out, you know, me incorporating styling into my work was A, I loved to do it and B, I would find things lacking when I'd go on a photo shoot or I'd find like that Tom Ford book again that's been photographed a million times and we all love Tom Ford but I can't shoot it again in a, in a, on a coffee table and mm-hmm. I would bring things to supplement or I knew was photogenic. Um, and then I developed this relationship with a local store and then it kind of was like, then word got out. Oh, Sarah brings four to five bags on every Sarah photo is shoot. the <laughs> photographer with the mostest. <laughs> and then I incorporated it into my contract and it's, 
it's one of those like, you get me, you get this. Even if I'm just showing up with my camera gear and maybe some amazing flowers I saw, or if I'm showing up with a truckload, it's, it's not something I've piecemealed out because I find that people who want to piece it out actually really need me to do mm-hmm. it. So, mm-hmm. um, my it's evolved for me to probably be I don't know maybe 60 70 percent but I love that I love getting in there and um mucking it up okay okay all right so I mean I just um I have to tell you quite frankly we have resisted doing um nice professional shots for window works because of it I mean first of all with window treatments you know we're 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 so far from the room being completed 90% of the time. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and of course, since we do retail, you know, let's face it, probably 60% of our clients aren't going to take it any further. They're never going to make the room. Like, you you know, as as professional interior designers, not every client does to completion. Could you imagine that? individual retail consumer that doesn't even use a designer for their window treatments like what am right. i what am i looking at right so our that's why we utilized um featuring the designers that we work with because you know our pictures are just like there's a drape the drape itself looks amazing but the rest of it looks like bob's furniture you know what i'm saying right. and i've just said i'm not gonna for me i'm not building a business do you know what i mean but mm-hmm. if i were building window works from the ground up over again and this in this age of media and images all over the place i think i would have to seriously consider allowing a whole day for that that's that's money out of my pocket if i've got kim and me back and forth to stores to get stuff and setting it up and i've got an installer in the truck bringing it back and forth you know all of that is it's money it's money yeah. and time and but i do think for interior designers it is a level more important i've got you know more than three decades of credibility that if the pictures are so so i you know i've got nine billion i've over thirty thousand clients that can attest to what we can right. do so that's not the case when you're starting a business right and they're selling a whole room that's essentially right. they're selling or a house or a feeling that's or right. vibe and so yes that you need those images to sell that feeling of yeah. you yeah, uh-huh. yeah, no, it's true. It's 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 challenging. Um, it is challenging, and but it is important. And I have to say, uh, it's a funny thing, Sarah. <laughs> I, if I've asked a seasoned designer, you know, if I've asked ten of them, what's the top one or two things you would share with a new designer for advice to you know get their business successful and get it going? I, I mean, eight out of 10 will come back with, oh, invest in great photography. And I'm like, that's awesome. How about that bookkeeper, though? <laughs> like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, like, rewind. Like, oh bookkeeper, yeah. then photographer. How about that for a plan? <laughs> totally. Totally. Know, know what you know and know what you don't know that's and it. hire out the rest. That's you know, it. Like. So, but it is so smart and it is so valuable. And it's so clear how passionate you are about it. And, and it's so clear what a partner you are. And I think that's also the big you know message that I'm hearing in your conversation, Sarah, is like, yes, I'm hearing your practical tips. I'm hearing your practical advice. I'm hearing you know the technique of your trade. But what I'm also hearing is that you know, you look at this as a partnership and you know that there's rules and regulations, but you want to educate the designer on what those are and be willing to have the conversation about what they mean and how it will affect each of your businesses. You're not just like, that's the way it is. See you bye. Yeah. 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 That's very important. And that goes to your first um, point with finding the right photographer, somebody that you can work with and that you feel that you have a rapport with, right? Yeah, and and can get the the vision that you want your business to look like. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I think it's awesome. I mean, you had a ton of other things here, but I mean, we don't have three days, so <laughs> okay, I mean, well. I love it. You you know, you have same thing as with relationships with local businesses. You talk about having relationships with local artists and yeah. our consultants, and that you particularly love finding new artists yourself and helping them. And what a great thing that is right here we got a brand new artist trying to find uh, their way in the world and you know yeah they probably put it in their own car and bring it over 
over for you because it's exposure for them. So that's an interesting thing. I like that too. And that's another thing because how many, no matter what, you know, probably most designers have experienced no matter what their client will do and reach to, that fine art level is a tough thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And and if it's not in their budget with the designer ahead of time, right. is not going to be at no. the end. Either, and if it's not important already... to the person, right? I mean, fine yeah. art has to be important to somebody or you have to have so much money that it doesn't matter. You know you should have it, so then you let the designer pick it. But um, when we talk about you know, 60% of the middle, you know, income client, they, you know, even if they love it, they might not have um, the budget or the appreciation to spend that money on that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's nice to have those relationships. But of course, it's just like anything else. You know, you put something in somebody's house and it looks pretty rocking. Somehow, some way, people come up with money for things, right? Right, exactly. (laughs) They fall in love. Art is is very emotional and passionate. And yeah, and you fall in love with a piece of art. Right. And if you, you don't love see it. it, yeah, if you don't see it, you don't miss it. But when you see it, right. you're like, ah, oh, love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, not, not to go around to window treatment and all that. It's like when you see someone without eyebrows, you don't really know like what's <laughs> totally wrong with them. And then they're like, oh, they need eyebrows. <laughs> it's like, you need eyebrows. Anyway, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's so funny. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad thank that you, you did such a great preparation for us and were able to help us understand all this. And, you know, you, you and your photographer buddies out there, you know I love you, right? Oh, we, <laughs> we love what we do. I feel super fortunate every day that I get to do what I do and wake up and go work in beautiful places and beautiful homes. I mean, I tell my husband, I'm like, I have a business trip, honey. It's going to be tough. I'm <laughs> going to Nantucket. You know, it's like <laughs> the places I get to go to every day for my work which is just unbelievable isn't that I love nice it. that's so nice that you love it so much that's, a, that's yeah. well that's why you're good at what you do that's awesome <laughs> thank you thank you Sarah thank for being here thank you so much for having me it's been wonderful all righty so we finally have had the copyright and usage conversation on the podcast. Um, I've had many people ask me to have it, and I was so glad that Sarah was very capable of walking us through and going through these different nuances with us. So I hope that you now understand it better than you did before. I know that I do. I really can't tell you that I had um, clarity on it. I was, uh, I just didn't. I, I absolutely know I did not understand the different layers. And now, thankfully, because of Sarah, I do. Uh, there's something else I want to point out in this episode. When I was editing the show and listening it to it again, you know, weeks after Sarah and I recorded it. When I go to edit a show, I pull out the notes that I took while we were talking. I pull out the research that I did before I sp- speak to the guest and I pull out their bio again and I look at their bio and their website. And what's interesting is a line that meant nothing to me now meant everything to me. In her bio, she said that she brings her Southern sensibility to her work. And the other line that she said in her bio was, Sarah's strengths lie in blending the needs of the client with her own unique and artistic approach to create beautiful and effective images. What I want to point out to you on these two statements is, Now, having heard the conversation, do you get how these really do speak to Sarah the way I do? The reason that I feel that they do is because, first of all, what is Southern sensibility? So if you're not from the U.S., maybe it doesn't mean anything to you. But I'll share with you that typically Southerners in the U.S. are considered to be more polite. They are considered to be more gracious. They are considered, they usually talk slower, right? So these are the overarching attributes that we would think of when you think of Southern sensibility. Okay. And now I want you to think about, there was a moment in the conversation when I pushed her back and I said, Sarah, not for nothing, but you can't capture a beautiful image. You can't capture and, and, you know, have a photograph that has gorgeous work in it that's, that's deemed gorgeous unless the designer first does their thing and making the room beautiful, right? And what's interesting is, think about it now I pointed out to you. 
with her Southern sensibility, she basically was like, no way, Jose. <laughs> okay. She said, well, you know, I don't really consider that I capture an image. She said, I create the image. Now, she acknowledged that it's easier for her to do if she's starting with a beautiful room. But what she did was, in a very nice, polite way, she pushed me back and she said, what I do is a talent and a skill. It's not by accident. And probably, she didn't say all this, but I bet you she knows that she can take an average designed room and have it ultimately the photograph be elevated because she's very confident in what she brings to the process. So I thought that was really very nice to see. We're always struggling with what is our only, what is our about you, our Fred Burns only, right? And something as simple as that is truly Sarah. And that other statement, blending the needs of the client with her own unique and artistic approach. Remember she talked about lighting, so as sweet as she is and um, as creative as she is and as, you know, Southern as she is, right, whatever you want to say, she said, I like to photograph with the lights off. And so, you know, she has her opinions and she knows from her experience what will work and what will not work. And so therefore, she's blending the needs of her client, just as she said, but she is careful and certain that she adds her own unique and artistic approach to it, okay? And the reason I'm taking so much time on this is because I know from conversations that I have with you at one-on-one -on -one and live events is that sometimes a client will want to do something and you won't believe it's, you don't believe it's the right thing to do. You, you know that you shouldn't be doing it, whether it's saying yes to a timeline, whether it's saying yes to a piece, whether it's giving in on a piece. And what happens so often is you, you do give in and then you get a poor result. And the problem is that the client is really almost always only evaluating the result. Okay. And when you stand there with the poor result and you say, but they forced me into it or they tied my hands, I want you to remember this conversation because Sarah, as politely and sweetly and as Southernish as she could, stood her ground in this conversation. And I'm sure she stands her ground when she works with you and she says, this is what I know. This is what's going to create a beautiful image. Please, let me take the wheel on this. So I want to give you the encouragement to do that as well, to take the wheel. You know what I say, if you've ever coached with me in real life, I say, here's the line. In my experience, right? When you say that to somebody, if they say, oh, I want the, you know, the blue sofa that's two feet too big for the room. In my experience, when we specify and we place furniture that really isn't appropriate for the room, my clients end up not satisfied, right? So whatever it is, but I want you to pay attention to that because in addition to all of the illuminating conversation about copyright and images, I really liked that little nugget right there. Okay. All righty. So, um, don't forget, let's all thank article.com, right? We have article.com, your go-to online furniture resource for mid-century Scandinavian inspired furniture, right? Do you, have you been to see their website yet and to look at what's available to you? You have living room furniture, you have dining room furniture, you have outdoor furniture, you have office furniture, you have accessories, tables. Um, you need to go and just start your trade account so that you can see if there's things in there that you can use to fill out projects or maybe to build a project around. Go to welldesigned.article.com. Welldesigned.article.com. Com. Okay. All righty. I am wondering what your to do item is today. Um, I have to say, I've been getting tons of terrific feedback about the most recent book, the uh, it's A Well Designed Business to Power Talk Friday Experts. You've been sharing with me on your stories and Instagram. You've been sending me emails, and I love it. I just love it because I adore each of the 12 people that took their time not only to share their expertise 
expertise on the podcast, but took their time to put the, their individual chapters together. And I am so grateful that you are enjoying the book and finding it useful. And I would ask you, if you do have your copy of the book and you have learned something from the book, would you go to Amazon and review the book for me? I would really appreciate it. We all know how this game works, right? The more reviews there are, then the more other people can find the book. Uh, my thing is, only if you mean it, right? I'm not asking you to do anything that I don't want. I don't want you to do anything that you don't feel that is true for you. But I am getting a lot of feedback and I'm loving it. My face is smiling every day. So, um, And also too, if there's a particular chapter that speaks to you, shout that, that co-author out in the um, review. That's so fun for somebody like that to get that pat on the back and to know that they've helped you in some way. So I really do appreciate it. All righty. I hope I'll see you in Las Vegas. Don't forget, I'm also going to be in Las Vegas on Monday, the 29th with IDS and my Doma studio. I'm going to do a solo presentation. I'm going to do a little riff on should I be worried? If you listen to that Power Talk Friday episode a few weeks ago, the things that you ignore in your business, we're going to talk about them straight talk. No, messing around. Um, But I'm going to share some strategies and things to overcome the challenges that you're going through too. That's at three o'clock at uttermost in building B. Okay. We're going to have a book signing there and everything. So please join us in Las Vegas. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Love to know. Tell me on this post in the Instagram or the Facebook feed, if you have a takeaway from this episode and what you, what action you're going to take based on it. All right. I hope that ultimately every action has to do with deciding to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.